I don't even know if there are parts of my heart that are carrying unforgiveness. I certainly haven't forgotten some of the wrongs that you have done to me, Stephen. Um, and the Lord's trying to work out that forgiveness. They were small wrongs. Uh, no, they were huge, humongous. Um, we'll do a whole episode on, on your sins. Um, yeah, that's going to be breaking. It's going to be awesome. Welcome back to the Calvary Assembly podcast. I am your host, Jonathan Sigmund, and I am joined with Pastor Bob, Pastor Stephen, and today we are going to be having an engaging and interesting conversation about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When when you say it like that, it just makes I feel everyone, like that's I feel like you got to put some oomph into it. Just, it just makes everyone uncomfortable. That's right. Well, <laughs> that's that? what I do. Uh, so uh, honestly, this is something that can be uh, very fearful yeah. for many people, especially for Christians, to think about what what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and especially because this has been chalked up to be the unforgivable sin, and most of us don't even know what this means. <laughs> that's a terrifying reality. What if I've done this? And so that's the conversation that we are going to explore today. We're so grateful that you are joining us and tuning in, and we feel honored that you would take your time to learn and grow with us today. So my first question for you guys today, are there any sins that are unforgivable? Didn't Jesus come to forgive all sins? Uh Give me, give me your answer to this question. Uh, so I guess this wouldn't be a, a podcast without this answer being true here, but Jesus seems to believe that there are some things that are unforgivable, which seems unimaginable because it does feel like Jesus uh, came here to forgive all sins, and we, we never want to think we're in a spot that we can't be forgiven, but uh, we're going to look at a story today where Jesus says that this, if you do this, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, whatever that means, that any other sin can be forgiven, but this one sin cannot be forgiven. And uh, so Jesus seems to think so, and what on earth that means, I guess we'll, we'll continue to talk through. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think there's a lot of people who've never been able to forgive themselves, so they're used to the concept if you add in the factor, are there some things even God won't forgive? Oof. I mean, they're already terrified. Add that in, and then what are those things, and have I done that? And and all of a sudden, rather than pursuing a life of faith, you're just terrified. It mm -hmm. becomes a fear-based approach to spirituality. So I think it's worth a, a conversation just because I think it can alleviate a lot of fear. Yeah. Well, let me, let me read this passage that we're talking about today. It's from Matthew chapter 12. I'm just going to read two of the verses. Uh, this is 31 and 32. And Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees, and he drops this line on them. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Sleep tight. You know? <laughs> right, right. Sleep tight. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so tell me a little bit more about your understanding of this. What, what's your interpretation of what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means? So this is really important. So when Jesus says this, he's talking with the Pharisees, as you mentioned, and it was right after he healed a man from a demonic spirit. And the Pharisees were who were uh, just famously not for Jesus. They did not like him, and they wanted to discredit him as much as they could. Um, he, they they saw what Jesus did, and they said, "Oh, don't worry, guys. This is it's not because Jesus Jesus is the Son of God. He was only able to do this because." Uh, he actually did because through the power of the prince of demons. So that's how he was able to get rid of demons. Uh, so Jesus is responding uh, very strongly to that, that what was done through the working of God, the Pharisees are calling through the work of demons instead. So that I think is an important framework to, to think through first before we go any further. Yeah, I mean, technically the word uh, blaspheme means to uh, use any language that's demeaning or disrespectful. And, uh, and so that really makes us apprehensive. Jesus seems to, to hone down a definition that ought to relieve a lot of us. He, he doesn't say if you're just disrespectful of the Spirit. Uh, their specific accusation is uh, the, the power by which you do these things is demonic. Mm. 
And so Jesus nuances this uh, definition down to something that's very unique, very peculiar. Uh, it's a much smaller uh, definition than a lot of religions would uh, give to uh, whatever their prophets, whatever their leaders, whatever their scriptures are. And so I actually think Jesus is narrowing in on something that's very specific here. Now, I have heard Christians or people say or believe that there are certain unforgivable sins. Mm -hmm. And the two categories I kind of hear this in the most uh, center around human sexuality sure. conversations, and uh, the other one being suicide. And so if you're to commit the, that, you know, that that's an unforgivable sin, is that is that what's happening here? It doesn't sound like it. And is that true somewhere else in Scripture, that that is somehow, uh, either of those things, an unforgivable sin by God? I think that a lot of times uh, people use language like that in order to, to make people afraid of exercising an option. Hmm. So we don't want someone to take their life, so we might indicate to them that if you do that, then you're not just ending this life, you're ending an eternal life. And uh, the goal, I think, is to inspire fear so you get some level of compliance. And when you think about it, the, the reason they say things like that is they love the person, they don't want the person to take their life. But uh, they're using an approach that, that we don't have a lot of scripture to support. And uh, so I think to say that uh, suicide is an unforgivable sin, uh, demonstrates a level of ignorance on a lot of things on our part. First of all, between the time that a person takes some action that could end their life, how much time exists there, and then what is God able to do with that time? And we don't know. And so for us to weigh in on that makes it very difficult. Uh, the second thing is we don't know the heart of the person who's, who's making that decision. It's one thing for a person to say, life is just too painful. I can't endure this another minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, as opposed to, I'm going to do this so that that person will know how bad they are and how much they hurt me. Those are two very different motivations of the heart. And so I, I think Christians ought to be very leery about declaring some things to be unforgivable when we don't have a biblical support for it. Yeah, and that, that's the same with uh, human sexuality. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you want to see what sins, uh, sexual sins that God is able to forgive, you don't have to go any place other than Scripture. We have every example <laughs> you can possibly find of sexual sin and how God was able to restore uh, people from that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Now, um, when, when we talk about unforgivable sins, usually my mind goes to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, like this passage we talked about. But I'm curious, are there any other places in Scripture that talk about any kind of unforgivable sin that any and all of us should be aware of so that we can avoid it? Or, yeah, not just I'm not just trying to fear monger out here, but I'm trying to, like, help us be aware. Is there any, is there any other places in Scripture that, that it talks about an unforgivable sin. Yeah, so there's actually, as far as I'm aware, so somebody can tell me if I'm wrong, there's actually one other place where there is another sin that, that uh, Jesus says is unforgivable, and it's found in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Jesus gives the famous Lord's Prayer where he's praying, says, hey, disciples, you should teach, or you should pray like this. Uh, and he says, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. He continues praying, and then he throws in a line right after the prayer, says, for if you don't forgive uh, your your brothers and sisters their sins, then neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. And he just kind of tosses that on there <laughs> at the end of his prayer. Uh, so there there is another instance where Jesus says it is unforgivable. If you do not forgive, then you will not be forgiven. If you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then you will not be forgiven. Uh, so there's two big ones where Jesus just straight up comes out and says it. And I think that both of these are actually very much related, though the passages are not related. I think that the idea is is very, very similar. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that first. Yeah, well, so what does it mean when we say we, we will not or cannot forgive someone? And basically, I think the thing we focus on the most is what they did to us was so painful and so egregious that whatever that line, red line is, they crossed it and, and that's that. But what are we saying? What we're saying is, is that that person is irredeemable. 
they can't change, they, they can't grow, they can't learn, they can't come back and, and seek restitution. And so what God is saying is, if we think that people can't be changed, how are you ever going to go to God? Because you don't think people can be changed. Like, it, if you're unforgiving, then you are unforgiven. It's, it's, you can't have a bifurcated view where I think this is true of me and God, I think this is true of me and everybody else. Yeah. So the so when Jesus is talking about this this whole Holy Spirit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit again it's so important because I think that we just feel like we could accidentally do this and oh my gosh now God's not going to forgive us anymore um, and what's happening here is that 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 the Pharisees are declaring that the power in which Jesus was able to heal that he was able to perform the the work of God in somebody's life was through the power of demons. And Jesus seems to be making this connection, is that if you are operating under the assumption that um, that God's working, God's power, and the way that he can restore things is through the power of demons, then 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 no work of God can be done in your life, mm. because you're, you're going to oppose that work. If you're saying, I don't want anything to do with that, because I think that's, that's through the prince of demons, or, or wh- whatever rationale you give yourself— then you're in a sense closing yourself off to the work that the Holy Spirit can do in your life. So, so if you say, "Well, I don't want anything to do with that work," then then by default it is unforgivable. Because if you are closing yourself off, if you are hardening your heart towards the working of God's uh, redemptive qualities in your life, then of course there can't be forgiveness for you because you're rejecting it and you're you're turning aside and say, "I don't want that because it's of demons, it's of this, or I don't want it for any other reason." So Jesus seems to be declaring that that this is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that you are closing yourself off and rejecting the very power of God. And if you're going to reject the power of God, then you cannot expect that the redeeming qualities of God would be done inside of your life and you would gain forgiveness. Mm-hmm. It, it does not work that way. Yeah, how do you think about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, where to begin? I, uh, I, I, think the, I think you've hit on something there that's really important. When we... Uh, when we assign something that God is at work doing to something demonic, we're making quite a statement. And uh, we're, we're saying that that line cannot be crossed because I don't know anybody uh, who's a rational human being who wants to surrender parts of their lives to the demonic. But what's true is when God comes and he deals with us, it'd be very, it would be easier if he always dealt with us in a formulaic sort of way where he, does this, he says the same words in the same way, in the same kind of seasons, in the same kind of situations. You know, that now we know that's God. And, and human complexity, both in terms of our interior life and our emotional life, as well as the complications of our exterior life, that God refuses to be put into a box. And so what he says is, you know, the, the person that he cast the demons out of, uh, that person was set free. That made some people very uncomfortable. And we must be very cautious if something makes us uncomfortable not to declare it, that that couldn't be God. Mm. Um, we, we have some examples of something that can't be God. You can't say Jesus is accursed and that's by God, right? You can't do that. But if, if something is happening, just because we don't understand it doesn't mean God is not at work in mm. it. Now, um, we're kind of looking at two different passages here with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and then the, the um, unforgiveness in your heart, <laughs> then watch out. Now, um, what if you're in a situation where you have unforgiveness of some sort in your life and you die? Are you now not accepted by God, if you've accepted Christ into your life and, and you've proclaimed him as Lord, if if you really have unforgiveness in your heart, is it that that door is closed to you? Right. Because it, that's kind of what that prayer alludes to in Matthew 6. Right, because I, who hasn't dealt with that? Right, you know? and that's why I, it's like you, any of us, I think, could get fearful at that because it's like, I don't even know if there are parts of my heart that are carrying unforgiveness. I certainly haven't forgotten some of the wrongs that you have done to me, Stephen. No. Um, and the Lord's <laughs> trying to work out that forgiveness. They were small wrongs. Uh, no, they small. were huge, <laughs> humongous. Um, we'll do a whole episode on, on your sins. Um, <laughs> no, wait. 
<laughs> yeah, that's going to be breaking. It's going to be awesome. Um, but but for real, that there can be legitimate um, unforgiveness in our sin that we're either aware of or could be even unaware of. And that's even more terrifying. Uh, how, how do you help a Christian process that? Yeah, so... I'm going to start off with something that might be more terrifying, but stay with me uh, as we kind of go forward and then bring it back a little bit. Um, So Jesus seems to believe that forgiveness is so intricate into the kingdom of God that if you are unwilling to participate in forgiveness, then, then you're missing a whole piece of what the kingdom of God is all about, that it is such a strong and large pillar and value in the kingdom, that if you choose, I'm I'm not going to participate in forgiveness, then, then you have missed the entire purpose of the kingdom of God at all. And if you say, you know what, Jesus, you can forgive me, but I'm not going to forgive other people, it's essentially like you're saying, I, I don't want to be a part of this kingdom of God thing. I, this is not what I'm about. Mm-hmm. So when Jesus says, if you're unwilling to forgive, um, then you're essentially saying no to the kingdom of God, and, and real forgiveness is not taking place inside of you. Um, So that's terrifying because, again, who has not dealt with some bitterness and unforgiveness in their life? I'm not just talking about minor things. I'm I'm talking about there can be years of unforgiveness that that people have to battle and work through. Uh, So does that mean that if I haven't fully resolved this and I pass away that that I'm not part of the kingdom of God or I'm not part of the kingdom of God now? And and I don't think that this is what Jesus is doing. I don't think he's trying to set a clear, like, um, you're in and you're out. If you do this, then you're in. If you don't do this, then you're out. I don't think Jesus is trying to to create a who's in and who's out thing. And I actually don't think that you can do this by accident either. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think sometimes we're just nervous, like, oh my gosh, I, I'm still worried about this. Like, I'm still bitter. Am, am I out of the kingdom of God? I don't think we can do this by accident. I think it is a... I think it is a decision to say that I, I don't want to be a part of this kingdom of God, mm-hmm. uh, that I have not just become bitter against this other person, but I'm, uh, but I'm angry at God, and in fact, I, don't want, I want nothing to do with God anymore. I don't want anything to do with him, his kingdom, his grace, and I've just completely removed myself from this. And I think this is the mindset and the mode and we're in where Jesus says, if you're in that position, then, then again, same thing with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You, you have closed yourself off to forgiveness, mm. so then you cannot expect to receive forgiveness. If you've closed yourself off to the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, then you have closed yourself off, and there can be, by default, no forgiveness for you. It's not like, oops, sorry, you, you, you made that sin, and now there's no redeeming uh, factor for you anymore. It's you, You're intentionally closing yourself off to receiving this forgiveness, so you, you can't receive that forgiveness. Mm. Um, so... Yeah, there's more. I have more on that, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I. So the whole, the whole concept is really intriguing to me. What if, um, in order for us, almost like reverse engineering, what if the way we experience the forgiveness of God, is to open the forgiveness valve, and that that has to allow yeah. uh, forgiveness going both ways. That somehow, and I, I think this is true, by the way. I've been in ministry long enough to know that people who who cannot forgive someone else often do not feel forgiven by God. They've, they've shut down that valve in their heart, and there's, they just can't get past it. I also think that we confuse the definition of forgiveness, and we equate it with a feeling, just like we do with love. Love mm-hmm. is a feeling. Forgiveness right. is a feeling. So we think that if I, unless I feel wonderful about you, somehow I've not forgiven you. I can forgive you and not trust you. Mm-hmm. That's a biblical concept. Uh, I can forgive you and put significant boundaries up to make sure that, uh, not just so that I don't get hurt, but so that you don't commit the sins again that you committed before. All of that is biblical. But there are people who really struggle with, well, I still feel bad about it, or the th- I keep thinking about it, right? And so this is what I encourage people is, when you think about it, and then you think about it again, and you think about it again, uh, just acknowledge to yourself and to God, I am choosing to forgive that person, which means I will not hurt that person back for what they did to me. Mm-hmm. That's forgiveness. Mm-hmm. That's it. That It's not I feel good about them, I have to let them back in my life and, and, and act as though nothing ever happened. It's That's not forgiveness. That's restoration. Uh, th- there's, there's a process for that, and it can happen if both parties are open to it. But I choose not to hurt a person back. But when it comes back up to my mind... And even my mind even might go, well, you know, I could say this or I could do that. Mm -hmm. Just to say, you know what? I'm just reminding myself, I have chosen to forgive that person. So it's not a matter of how do I feel about that person. It's a matter of what 
limiters have I put on my reactions to that person? And if I've chosen not to hurt them back, there's no reason to think that I'm committing some sin against them. You you brought this up in a, a sermon on a Sunday morning not too long ago, and it, it was really eye-opening for me, that, that forgiveness is also not feeling, it's not the absence of the pain that they have caused you right. either, that you can still feel all of the pain and all of the hurt of how this person has, or what they have done to you, and still forgive them. And um, I, that was really important for me, because um, I would just equate that with, well, I'm just bitter still. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I actually, I'm just still feeling the open wounds of what happened to mm -hmm. me, and I can still make that conscious decision. I am not going to get back at them. I'm not going to wish harm for them. And, and that is my way in which I can forgive. So that was really reassuring because uh, many of us still struggle with the wounds of what people have done to us. It doesn't mean you haven't forgiven them because the act of unforgiveness is choosing to get back at them, get right. even, or yep. sometimes even go one-up them mm -hmm. uh, to what they have done for me. And that's what real unforgiveness is. And more times than not, um, and I'm not a I'm not a perfect person. Mm. <laughs> Some of you know that better than others. Uh, but more often than not, that's not where my heart goes, that I'm going to, uh, like, I really have to intentionally be there sometimes, that I'm, I'm going to go get even with this person. That's a whole different mindset that yeah, I'm, right. I'm really struggling with the hurt. I'm really struggling with pain right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's two very different things. And I, I think this might be what Jesus is getting at, is that if I choose this mode of unforgiveness— then I, I'm missing out on the pillar and the value system of the kingdom of God, and I'm, I'm ignoring, I'm slamming that door closed, mm -hmm. and that grace cannot penetrate into my life if I'm slamming the door closed on that. And the very essence of who Jesus is, is forgiveness. Right. Like, it's like the core part yeah. of who he is, of what he came to do. It's like, it's, it's his whole framework uh, by how he mm -hmm. operates. And I think even the way of Jesus that he invites us to is to love our enemies. Well, sometimes we think of our enemies as these foreign terrorists out there, right. but sometimes the enemies we're battling right now are the enemies that are going on in our heart where we've just got this lack of forgiveness. And I, I think you guys bring up a great point that it is about continually going back to God and having asking him to help you and, and maybe even going to your counselor too, um, which I, Lord knows I have done that on many occasions to try to like help myself grow in the area of unforgiveness and uh because i don't i don't ever want to let that bitterness right. keep seeping up inside of me and i think this is why uh jesus has used such strong language for us because it's a core part of the kingdom of god it's a core part of who jesus is it was his mission is to come on a rescue mission to save us and mm -hmm. and so i i th i think this is all just super important for each of us as followers of Jesus. It's also important to note, Jesus will often uh, just speak in ways that are just like, it's like a gut punch. Mm -hmm. Well, he'll just use very vibrant and very drastic lang language for things. It's not that he's doing something that's untrue, of course, but he'll say things in a way because he wants to get people's attention, mm. uh, and 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 he succeeded in doing so. And then he will be able to, later in his ministry, he works that out and mm. fleshes that out, what it looks like in real time, in real life. Uh, but I think if this is like a gut check for us, I think Jesus intends it to be so. Like, this is such an important value to him mm -hmm. uh, that, we, that we have to be thinking through these things, and we have to be understanding how Jesus came to live. So uh, so we should not shy away if you get something that's like, I just got slapped in the mouth here. There's a good chance Jesus is, is trying to show us, like, this is really important, and we should be aware of this. And I always think about this too. If you have unforgiveness in your heart and it goes unchecked and you don't try to battle against it, where does that take you down oh, yeah. in your life? Like it, it takes you down a pathway and you've probably experienced people like this in your life where it's like, man, it, yep. it just keeps growing in bitterness and bitter. And it's, it is a, it is a dark, ugly path. And I think that's part of what Jesus is getting at is like, he has a much better path, a path of freedom for us, even when it's somebody else who has wronged us or our loved ones or anything, like he does not want to see his children go down that path. And it's like, yeah, I, I think it's a gift he's trying to give us, not a, a scare tactic for us to be wondering at every moment, oh, shoot, am I like 
perfectly? Have I perfectly forgiven? Right. Like Jesus has forgiven me. Like no, I, I right. I'm working it. You know, yeah, I think I think we can. It, this happens for us in Scripture. It's like we take this one little phrase right. and right. we try to build a whole theology out of it, and like that's not what Jesus was trying to do in that moment. And it, so, very practically, uh, how many times have we all seen? I'm sure everyone has friends who have been this way, where they were in the church, loving Jesus, following God, and they were hurt by the church in some way, mm-hmm. whether fair or not, they were hurt by the church. And then the trajectory of their life afterwards becomes one step after another where they have turned away from God, where they're so consumed by this bitterness, they've completely left the church, they completely left God, their faith, uh, everything, scripture, and they don't even care anymore. And that, to me, feels like this is where this is where um, Jesus is talking about. It's not. It's not like oh, I could accidentally slip into this. It's you haven't dealt with this bitterness. And to your point, if you allow that bitterness to fester over time and years, you harden yourself off to God. It's like I just don't even want God anymore, mm-hmm. and I don't want this faith. I don't want this Jesus thing anymore. And uh, that feels like the trajectory of where this goes. If if we don't deal with bitterness, right. if we don't deal with forgiveness. Um, yeah, so and and who hasn't seen that taking place in our in our lives, especially today? Right. Yeah, the only like caveat, and I know you would think this way too, Stevie, and Stephen, yeah. that I would say with like the example you give is like with church hurt, like there's there's just such a range and gamut of that. And I think of like some of the like really horrible abuses that have happened in the church and how damaging that oh, has sure. been, yeah. um, you know, of people in power towards children and things of this it's nature right. that like that does mess you up. Oh yeah. And um, that is not right. And that is not, you know, and so um, I know that's not what you were thinking as you're processing that. I just, I wouldn't want somebody to think like, oh, if you've, if you've been hurt by a church leader in some crazy abusive yeah. way, um, that's not the, that's not what you were talking about well, there. Well, here, here's, this is good, because this is really, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, what is forgiveness but recognizing that what was done was wrong? You have to start there. You have Absolutely. to start there. And, and I think that sometimes we we think forgiveness is minimizing the mm. wrong to say that this, really was, this was not a, uh, this was, you know, it was, wasn't as bad or their intentions were in the right place. No, forgiveness, real forgiveness is recognizing that what was happened to me was wrong. It was inexcusable. But forgiveness is instead of me trying to get back at them, I'm going to show mercy instead, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to retaliate. doesn't mean you don't get justice. That mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you don't go to authorities and things like that. But I am not going to retaliate and do unto them what they have done to me. And that is what true forgiveness is. It's recognizing what you have done is inexcusable. Without that, real forgiveness is really difficult to yeah. take place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, now now bringing it back to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, 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 Spirit. <laughs> um, that was an effect um, that they just added. Uh, they didn't. No, they didn't. <laughs> they okay, didn't. Uh, that was all natural. <laughs> uh, but we forgive. You. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Stephen has often said, "I'm the gift that just keeps on giving." Yes, <laughs> and that... I mean that in whatever way you take right, it to right. believe. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take it how I want. Uh, so when it comes to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, like our are us as Christians or anybody watching, are we in danger of committing this? How do we know if we have or could do this? Like, I think it can be a real fear factor for us that we don't want to blasphemy God. Uh, so how do we know that we haven't done this? How do we know? Uh, can, can you help us, Pastor Bob? <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing I would say is it's not something that can be done accidentally. There's a kind of intentionality that is required that uh, permeates a lot, if not all, of our being. So you don't accidentally blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Secondly, is that if you actually cut the Spirit out of your life, you've decided that whatever the Spirit is doing is demonic and you want no part of it in your life, then uh, you've put yourself in a position where uh, you, you have no convicting work of the Holy Spirit, you have no work of a desire to repent of anything. And so you've completely eliminated that out. What's interesting to me is a lot of times when we feel conviction, we think that's just our conscience speaking rather than the Holy Spirit dealing with us. And so if we feel bad about something or we feel worried about something, that could actually be an indicator that the Holy Spirit is at work in order to help us move on from something or repair something. And so we should take that seriously. 
But this idea that I can just accidentally do this is not what Jesus is talking about. And if we do cut the Spirit out of our life, we won't care mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. We won't care about God. We won't care about uh, reconciliation. We won't care about anything. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear people who care, I'm worried they've done this, that's already evidence that they haven't. Yeah. So they, they have not crossed that line. And they may be overly sensitive to it, but that's not where they've gone. There's a really cool story that people like to debate all the time with uh, Pharaoh in Egypt, where his heart is getting hardened back and forth. And uh, Scripture is really cool with this, that it just... Um, in the beginning of the story, it says that Pharaoh hardens his heart towards God. He hardens his heart, his hardens his heart, hard, hard, hardens his heart. And then eventually there's a shift where it says that God hardens his heart. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that God is just there, like, uh, actively making his heart a stone. But I think that eventually that Pharaoh has hardened his heart uh, and turned away from God over and over again, where God just finally releases his hand and says, okay, fine, mm -hmm. I'm just going to give you what you want now, and I'm going to release you over to your own decisions and eventually where Pharaoh's heart is so hard, he, he cares nothing about the things of God. He cares nothing about the commands of God. He cares nothing about the people of God. He wants to put him back into slavery, and he just doesn't care. And it leads to his own destruction eventually. Um, again, but it, it's not—I think if we're worried about this, there's a good chance that it's it's probably not true yeah. of us. Because, like you said, that the Spirit is still working inside of us. He's still active inside of us. Yeah. And I think that's that's always important. It's like you can't take this to a crazy point where it's like, okay, so our goal needs to be perfection in all areas. Like you, you're, we're, we're never going to get there, you know. Um, but at the same time, uh, Jesus invites us into this amazing way of walking with the Spirit, of being empowered by Him, and being able to be forgiven so that we can forgive others. And uh, man, what a, what a freeing reality that that really is. And there always is, like some, we think of this, I don't think what Jesus is saying is once you've checked this box, you're done forever. Right. I think there is a, there, there is always an opportunity to come back. That if you're in that mode of like, I don't care about God, I don't think about him, is you're, you're not done yet. Like right. God's still not done with you. That, that you have slammed the door, but that doesn't mean that door cannot be opened yeah. back again. Again, what Jesus is just saying, that by default, it means that there's no forgiveness because you're choosing to reject it. But if that door creaks open just yep. a little bit, yep. then then the Holy Spirit is right, and we're right back where we are, and the Holy Spirit's doing His work inside of us again. Uh, so there is still hope for people. It is it is not done until it's done mm -hmm. kind of thing. So. Well, I think even understanding the motive of Jesus for addressing this kind of thing. There's another passage in Scripture that says, beware lest the root of bitterness take uh, root in your life, and it has uh, this capacity to, to dominate so much of your life. Jesus is not saying, you're unforgiven, and that really ticks me off. Jesus is saying that when you allow this bitterness to dominate your life, it chokes everything else of life out of you. Mm -hmm. And that's, Jesus came that we might have life to the full. We can't have a full life and be unforgiven. Yeah. So his motive is not, you broke a rule and now you're going to pay. His motive is his heart is breaking because you're not enjoying the life you could have if you simply followed his word. Yeah. Truth. Truth. Well, uh, gentlemen, I super appreciate this conversation on blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, on uh, unforgiveness, all of it. I think all of this is very helpful, and I just want to let you know that if you uh, have not already seen, we released another episode on the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, that we'd love for you to be able to check out. Uh, those will be in the description below. And the other thing I would encourage you, if you're looking to grow in your understanding of who the Holy Spirit Spirit is. Um, our church is in the midst of uh, a series of teachings, uh, over eight weeks of teachings on the Holy Spirit that we would love for you to tune in. It's right on this channel. Uh, we'd love for you to continue to grow in your relationship with God. He is for you. He loves you. And he is accessible with his forgiveness for you, regardless of what you have done. That door is still open for him, uh, for you to come home to him. And so I uh, want to encourage you to continue continue to grow in your faith. We hope that this has been a helpful and practical conversation for you and uh, that you don't have to live by fear of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Instead, you can know that you can live by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells inside of you. Thanks for watching.